this is a regular workshop meeting of the Jacksonville City Council will come to order. Uh, we have a copy of the proposed agenda that replaces, and then this time I would uh, entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Mr. Mayor, we have the add on. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. You did get an add on that was on the email that you received this afternoon, and we're going to put that as number seven under consent. Well, it'll put B6B B under consent. <clears throat> so now I would uh, entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. Make a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. Second. I have a motion to second. Any discussion? If there are none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Next, we have adoption of the minutes from the July 19, 2022 regular meeting. Move approval as presented in the minutes. Second. A motion to second. Any discussion? If there are none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. All right, so we're going to go down here down to number seven, and the first item uh, is the first item under our discussion tonight, and we have we have folks, some folks representing the Carolina Museum of the Marine, uh, Joe here, uh, and y'all are going to make a little presentation for us. Are you going to well, lead into it? Uh, you want to lead into it, or yes, are you just going to yeah, just say we, we have uh, the, ex the executive director, Ashley Dan Danielson, right. here, and Joel Hull. You all know Joel, Joel Hull. Come, Come on, on up, up to the table. To the table. <laughs> Come join us. Thank you. Thank you. So each of you, it's, let me back up. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you to be able to talk to you about what's going on with Carolina Museum of the Marine, Al Gray Civic Institute. It, we've come a long way. This gentleman right here, Sergeant Major Joe Hull, has stayed the course in September this year will mark the 23rd anniversary of the incorporation of this organization. And so you'd say to yourself, why would something take so long to happen? And as a nonprofit professional since 1986, I can tell you this isn't the first time we've ever seen that happen. There are many, many reasons. But what's really a better question that I asked myself when my husband and I came here to work with this organization is what kind of a mission must it be that it can last that long? Who are the faces of the people behind this? And so I have, a, I'm not making this up, a stack of notebooks from day one that stacks this high. There's over 25 notebooks from every meeting I went to. He helped me meet 66 people in two weeks. And I kept hearing the same things. So I want you to see where we are now. I love our new logo. Feel free to give that rousing applause. Don't you think that's <laughs> important? <laughs> Very we all know who General Al Gray is. He's probably the most famous uh, Carolina Marine we'll ever know. But this is what we have now. And you all have been with us through this whole course. And you can see this on the slides. I'm not going to read them to you, but I want you to just kind of let your minds go back to all of the years you've been involved in it. The city's been involved in it. Our community's been involved in it. So much so that Senator Brown and then Senator Mike Lazara got $26 million put into the state budget for the construction of this organization's building. So we'll be able to build a 40,000 square foot state-of-the-art museum and institute, an enduring tribute to Carolina Marines and sailors, their families, and the communities that support them. That means you. We have award-winning architectural designs that are 100% complete. We're in the process of having them revised and updated to meet the current codes because they're a few years old. And I think this was brilliant at the time it was phased into phase one and phase two. I think it was brilliant that the infrastructure, the in-ground infrastructure for the museum itself is in place on the site. I, that is remarkable. I, I applaud whoever thought of doing that. And we have a stunning site with an already well-known icon. Has anybody in this room failed to see this? You've all been there. Every time you go to Lejeune Memorial Gardens, the park is filled with people. It's a reverential, beautiful, spiritual place to go. It reminds us all of the great sacrifices people have made on our behalf so that we could sit here and hold meetings with government and, and vote. So this is a really inspirational place in our community already. When it opened in 2016, immediately began to be used. It's the it's site of weddings, reenlistments, promotions, retirements, many, many um, ceremonies there. And the entire park is the same way. If you've been to Memorial Parks at other 
Marine bases, Marine Corps bases, or Army bases, or anywhere, you will never see one that's more beautiful than this one. So if you have anything to do with the design of it, you need to take a deep bow. It is a spectacular place to be. When you look beyond the Eagle Globe and Anchor, you see what a site, the proposed site for the museum. That's where the in-ground infrastructure is. It's going to be an incredible view. When you see it, um, when you see it from the bypass, there will be a big cube that comes off the back of the building, and it has a Marine in it. And the Marine looks as if his or her eyes are following you when you go by the museum. I think that'll be a pretty attention-getting thing for our community. But also in 2016, that was the year I started. That's coincidental. They were doing strategic planning when they started with me, and I drank that information out of a firehouse. Sergeant Major Joe Cool knows everything that's, I could just have his face on every slide, could I not? <laughs> and we would all know that he did hear it. Everybody, this is what I'm saying when I show you the stack of notes someday. Everybody mentioned this man, General Al Gray, 29th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. Everyone mentioned him over and over and over again. I went down to the National Aviation Museum, they mentioned him. I went to the National Marine Corps Museum, they mentioned him. Finally, I went to him. Who got me that appointment? <laughs> Sergeant Major Joe Hull, with a little help from his buddy Colonel Cox. So I sat down in front of him, and here's what we came up with. Here's what he came up with. Let's get some other people involved. Let's pull together a think tank. Let's see who can bring to the table a new business model for this organization. And so six degrees of separation, isn't it interesting to you? One person you know knows someone else, and it, and it keeps building and building and building. And we have many more people involved on our board uh, than you'll see here. But right now, our <coughs> acting chair, Mark Kramer, is somebody whose bio you'll see at the bottom of your slide notes. And please, I won't read that to you now, but you need to take a little time to look at that. This is a highly qualified man to launch an institute. He launched the Institute for Defense and Business at Chapel Hill. He and another gentleman are the founders of that organization. We regret deeply the passing of our chair um, in June, Brigadier General Richard F. Furcotteran, who served us well for almost three years as our chairman, and we uh, we will always be mindful of his contributions. Talking to General Gray, here's what came up. We have a nation of people who haven't been taking civics for a while. We've been taking STEM. There's nothing wrong with STEM, we need STEM. But we haven't been taking civics, and so there was some confusion about exactly what our form of government is, what can be approved, what, what needs to be protected. Why do Marines take, why do all of our military take an oath to protect and defend the Constitution? Why is that making it possible for us to all sit here? And so General Gray's idea was to combine the museum with an educational component, which we ended up calling Al Gray Civic Institute, to achieve this mission, to achieve this mission. Honoring the legacy of Carolina Marines and Sailors, Sustaining the ideals that are the foundation of our nation, inspiring principle, committed citizens. And that mission is coming together. We are so pleased with it that we decided to see, is this a sustainable business model, a museum with an institute? We've got one board member, if you know Captain Pat Alford, he likes to call it the Museum Toot or the Instazeum. But we had to combine it with a, a sustainable business model. We had to look for ways to make it make money, and that's why we're here tonight. And I'm going to run through these very quickly because I don't want to take too much of your time tonight. I want to leave time for questions. But the Civic Institute has already gotten started. It will provide uh, online, on-site, on-location courses in leadership and civics to corporations, schools, whether they're private schools, public schools, home schools. It will provide them, they'll come to cities and county municipalities, providing training to their, to their employees, wherever people want these courses. Right now, they, we have debuted the class called the um, Critical Thinking for Civic Engagement. It's debuted in two places, Swansboro High School with 40 children there, young, young adults, I should call them, and then with Marines, active duty Marines at Camp Johnson, who are awaiting their MOS training. And, in all cases, the response has been transformative. I'll show you that in just a second. So the Institute's going to have an online learning platform 
Some of it will be behind a paywall. Some of it will not. We'll have tiered podcast subscriptions, live stream classes, master classes, guest speakers. We're going to have a summer camp called the Hool School. General, uh, I don't know if you know General Brigadier General George Walls out of Raleigh, Geary area. He's working with Sergeant Major Hool to design a summer program. It'll be about five days, and it'll be teaching young people middle school and high school civics, leadership, and fitness. And so we're really excited about that. We think that's going to be very successful. Museums, we already know what museums do to raise money. They rent their venue. We'll have a venue that's available for this community for people to rent. We'll have a place to have military balls. We'll have a place to have uh, seminars and symposia. It, it'll be a multi-use building. It'll have its own cafe, have a bookstore and, and gift shop. There'll be lots of ways for the museum to make money. But alongside it will be that institute, which we hope will build a following of people who just really want to learn the facts not the rhetoric, but just the facts of how we function as a government, why it's so important to participate. And then, of course, simulators. We went down to um, Fort Benning and found out that simulators are a really good way for museums to make money. And so we plan to have as many simulators as is feasible. They had one that for $5 a person, they were clearing 25000 a month just on one simulator. Now, I don't want to sound too greedy, but we all know that we're going to need to have ways to, to support and sustain. Apart from fundraising, we are a nonprofit and we always will be. We will always be fundraising. We will always do annual campaign for operating. We will always do capital campaign for replacing equipment, for doing new exhibit designs. There will be multitudinous reasons to always be raising funds. And we will also be building an endowment. So if you're in here right now and you don't know who to put in your will, Carolina Museum of the Marine, Al Gray Civic Institute, your life insurance policy is going to win. These are the ways to build a corpus that never gets judged, and we live off the interest. And by we, I mean the operating expenses. So these are the different kinds of funding streams that we're working on developing, and others are coming along as we get to know ourselves and, and, our, and the concept of uh, earned income better. When I say that we're creating transformative experiences for visitors and students of all ages. We better be. General Algray says that the museum needs to be transformative. And what he means by that is when you come in the door, you better be bitten by sand fleas from Paris Island. You better smell cordite. You better understand what goes on for the people who serve in our Marine Corps and our, and our Navy. And so he wants us to have immersive, interactive uh, displays rather than static. The same thing is true of the Institute, but what we're finding out with the classes, when you speak straightforward English at a high school or a Marine base, you'd be amazed at the response you get. These are just a few of the quotes. You have them in your packet if you can't see the slide. But my favorite one I put on top, because it's my favorite one. This was a high school student. She had been told by her family, no one in our family has done anything more than we're doing. We'll always live here. We'll always have trouble making ends meet. We'll always have trouble finding food. We'll always, always, always. And she said she learned in the class that she still loved her family, but she didn't have to choose that as inevitable. She knew she had it in her to choose differently. And she had so much fun learning how to think, not what to think. I think one of the best quotes that we got from the active duty folks was not to be afraid to discuss uncomfortable or controversial subjects, to understand that you can have raucous debates with people. You can, as long as you're coming with facts and not name calling, you can have really interesting discussions and grow. Both parties can grow from the experience. And so one of the things that General Gray would like to see us do is have debates. And we may even end up having uh, debate competitions between high schools, I hope. I think that would be, or in colleges, I think that would be fun to bring that back. A lot of people, you, you all don't need this um, testimonial about what the museum can do, who can it bring to this community. We all know that, that what's, who's going to come here. And the TDA has given us lots of numbers on this over the years. These are, that's where I got these. Um, we know that people will come. We, we get called all day. People stop by what I call our construction trailer behind sign and ask, where's the museum? When's it going to open? When can our family see it? We also know that it rains in North Carolina. And the beach is no fun at all when it's raining. So I'm hoping that we'll advertise really well along the beach communities and get people to come in 
you know, an hour or 45 minutes to see the museum. So I think, I think we have a really good shot at that. Um, where do you come in? We would like to ask the city of Jacksonville through the TDA to consider supporting us for the next few years as we get the thing built, as we get the museum and institute built as we launch its programs. So we're asking for $100,000 in operating expenses this year, expenses this year, and then the opportunity to come before you and the TDA in future years, depending on how sustainable it is as we go. We, we hope we can phase out of needing any help from municipalities, um, government organizations, but we know to start with, to supervise it and to start bringing in the employees that the state construction grant won't pay for, we're gonna need your help. There's a video uh, that you've seen, I know many, many times, that I would have played right now, but I don't think that we need to do it. You just need to see a picture of Sergeant Major Hull and General Al Gray. <laughs> who are staying the course with a lot of people behind them. There are so many people to thank for this. There's no, I can't, the name's in my notebook. I'm just, I, Sergeant Major and I are just sitting listing all these people and there'll be a donor wall and sort of like the landowner's wall at the park, a, a place to show all the people who had anything to do with it, whether it was a good idea, a strong contribution, a kind word, when things weren't going well one day, we've got a lot of people to thank and you all should count yourself among them. Do you have any questions about what I've outlined? I know I went through it quickly and we're trying purposefully to be brief. When, when are you expecting to uh, advertise for construction bids? We are doing that later this summer. We are in the process now of um, redoing the architectural plans. They're gonna help us get a construction manager, put together the RFQs, the RFPs, American all of that. Oops, so it turns out the video wants to talk. <laughs> so we believe that toward the end of the summer, we hope, we hope we can start construction next year. If everything goes the way it's supposed to, and I know you know, I know you know how construction goes. But we are optimistic, and all of the all of the people are lining up. Now, here I save the best for last. We were able. Uh, you're getting that. You're getting the scoop on this, and whoever's watching, you get the scoop on this tomorrow morning uh, at 0800. We're going to have a press release that goes out announcing that we've hired our first ever chief executive officer, Brigadier General Kevin Stewart. He retired in 2021. Uh, he's a logistician. He is going to do great things for this project. He will be overseeing the construction, the ramping up of the Institute. I will stay as the Vice President of Development. Sergeant Major Houle defies title. He has a title, Director of Operations and Artifacts, but he's all things to all people and a joy to work with. And, and our accounting manager, Dick Keckert, is still with us after 16 years. So we have a strong team and we hope that you'll be a part of it. Any other questions? Questions, Council? No. Comments? Let me just, the, the, I know you're in the process of, of getting approvals from the Navy. Yes. Can you provide an update on where that is? It left the base with their endorsement, their uh, happy endorsement. It went up to headquarters. And to my knowledge, it is now, and you can let me know if I'm wrong, at Department of Navy Facilities. <clears throat> it's at set uh, for the final. Because when we, when everything was approved back in 2007, the fine print says in contingency of having the money in the bank. So we had to go back with a letter saying we've now have the money in the bank. And we're just waiting for him to seize that letter and put his John Henry on it and send it back to us so we can put a shovel in the, back, in the ground. So it's moving along. So, so it's at the sec depth? It's at sec yes. depth now. Yes. So NAVFAC? It's all been from that fact. It's all, yep, it's all gone. What is also the county so far? What is also the county government uh, offered you? We have a grant with them this year for 75000 And that is out and of their general fund? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. <clears throat> um, the estimate of the, of the cost for the building. Yes. I'm sure that's fluctuated somewhat with the, yes. in this environment. Uh, 
Well, we were pleased when we met with the architects that they didn't um, seem underwhelmed by the 26 million. They, they had estimated 10 million for the building. We estimated 16 million. Now we're estimating about 19. The total project is probably gonna come in right under 28. But as you know, that's a moving target right now. And so our answer to that is, you know, if we, if we can keep enough staff to oversee everything else, then what we'll do is just keep raising whatever is needed as it's needed. Uh, and it's, it's much easier as, as a long-term nonprofit manager, fundraiser, I can tell you it's much, much easier to raise major gifts when people see the building coming out of the ground. And you all know that you've been waiting patiently for a very long time. So we will do whatever it takes to, and it will happen. Questions, counsel? Will people get charged general mission to get in or is it yeah. open or? Um, there was talk for a long time about having it be a free uh, admission, but most museums have gone away from that now just because it bankrupted them. I do think that we need to do something different and special for the military community. Well, so it's a lot of young military families yes, that we, might not be able to spend right. two or three kids right. and it uh, might be right. a big expense to that's, that is, Absolutely, we would not want to cause people who are active duty not to see the museum. Mm -hmm. but. But the retired veterans around here are going to pay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to work yeah. out them. There's a lot of young you know, people. Right? Yeah. Not, 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 if I still have a job tomorrow, tomorrow, won't that be fun? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, if I may, what we have talk, spoken about is that if a service member comes in uniform, you don't pay. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, but uh, a price of a, going to the movies yeah. may be the price to get to the door. Okay. There will be yearly. You can buy a yearly pass, and we'll be discounted and uh, things like that. So there'll be there's different ways that we can get the people in there. God has a vision like people coming to visit their family members that yes. are in them service that might yes. want to go and exactly. see it from other places. So I mean, we have about 600 uh, students a year, a month that graduate between the, the bases here. Their families come here from all over the country because they don't go to Paris Island or or San Diego. They come here, they're only going to be here, you know, once a year or whatever. So, I mean, there's, there'll be different things that we can, that we'll be able to do. Yes, sir. I mean, we also anticipate a lot of field trips from the neighboring schools. Yeah. Uh, so, I, and we would not obviously talk for that. So, that's, that's where it's really nice to get sponsors. Mm -hmm. so, anyone else? Y'all are scheduled to go before the TDA and present it, right? I don't know that we have a firm date. Do we have the no, date yet, sir? Well, we expect it would probably, if you you want to see the TDA, it be in their next meeting, which I think is September. September. Yes. Oh, we'll make certain, certain that we're there. Yep, exactly. And we appreciate that <coughs> very much. If you think of other questions or comments, um, my contact information is on the back of the brochure, and you probably have uh, Sergeant Major Hool on speed dial. Uh, I'd be so surprised if you did. We've got blocked. <laughs> Get the call blocked, you said. Yeah, he gets call blocked. That's funny. So, um, we appreciate so much your time, and we appreciate everything that you all did to make Phase 1 possible. So, exactly. Bless you all. Thank, well, thank you. you very much for thank your you. time. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you guys sticking with us for 23 years. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, I was a young man when we started this thing. You were. <laughs> <laughs> so was I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you all yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You guys Thank have you. a blessed Thank evening. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor and Council, before I get started on one of one of the things that we've sort of changed with this agenda a little bit is, you know, <clears throat> I've added a. a an item or a, a, a staff report, so to speak, for each item. I mean, uh, I know previously we would send out sort of a summary of some of the discussions. What I'm trying to do is basically uh, make sure that every item has got a little bit of background, if appropriate, and especially those items where we might want to move to actually approve it. You know, with, with, we, we've had enough discussion, we agree, we'll approve it. And so with enough information uh, with that agenda item, hopefully then you'll feel more prepared to be able to make some of those decisions rather than just announcing, well, if you agree, you know, will you approve it for me? So you know, we're still evolving, you know, what the information will, will contain. 
Uh, we may have to adjust the format of the report, but th that's something I'm trying, and, and you can certainly give me feedback on that. Uh, here's an item, of course, that we talked about last council meeting. I'm not going to go over the details. You saw this uh, last council meeting on the history. Uh, you saw what the policy is in effect right now. We talked about it last meeting. What I took is what I got out of that discussion. And here's you know a summary of the, the proposed amendment uh, that we can talk about and we can make further tweaks and bring it back for approval. Or if you're comfortable with it, we can approve it tonight. But basically, I've extended the 60 days to six months. Uh, we talked specifically about who uh, the council felt should live in the city, and that's manager, deputy, assistant managers, city attorney, public safety director, public services director, and fire chief. And I think out of the discussions that the rest of the directors were willing to be flexible with their requirement to live in the city. However, we expect everybody, not just the directors, all the directors and above to be actively engaged in the community and community activities and that. So that's what I've drafted in that proposed uh, uh, change to uh, the city code. And uh, if council uh, wants to have further discussions, we can have that. If, if not, uh, if you're ready to approve it, you can approve it that way. Looks good to me. I agree, it's much better than it was. I have a question, Mr. Massey, with, um, with re um, exempting public service director and fire chief. Um, does the city currently provide um, a vehicle for transportation for those individuals to travel back and forth home or? The, the only person there, well, the public safety director and the fire chief they will have, have vehicles. Right. They, well, they do right now. The, the rest of the individuals do not have vehicles. Okay. If they're not well, exempted, they would be required to within yes. six months. Move Those them. vehicles are only used for respond, responding to Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <clears throat> Somebody want to make a motion to adopt this? Ms. Edwards. Make a motion to adopt the amended uh, ordinance for personnel requirements and residency requirements. I'll second. have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Right, thank you on that, Ron. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. The next thing I wanted to bring up is a, a couple of weeks ago, we sent out a proposed change to this HR procedure. And because of some electronic problems, it wasn't clear what we were trying to change. So I, I decided the best thing to do, since we do have some new council members, is just review a little bit the HR procedures and policy and, and how, who generates them and who approves them. And then we can specifically look at this one. So the, uh, let me just go through a little bit of background. Um, this is from the city code. And uh, with that, uh, the city manager is basically responsible for at least preparing these personnel policies and procedures. Uh, however, there's there's uh, some exceptions on, on on approving, and and this is also in the code. And, and there you can see that new human res <coughs> resources policies and procedures relating to hiring, firing, and compensation must be approved by mayor and council. How long has that actually been in effect? Do you have any idea? It's yeah, that, that was actually years, uh, 2007 when we adopted the Springstead, when we split the ordinance, when we split, when we took some of the personnel rules out of the city code, we established this new procedure. And that was right. November of 2007 to be exact. That, that's correct. When Kimberly came on, uh, we were fortunate to find a lady who she knew who was actually down at the beach was able to work with us. At that time, all of the rules and procedures and so forth were in the city code. 
According to the law, if it's in the city code, you have a property right. And you have, you know, it's due process, et cetera, et cetera. So we were advised by the School of Government and working with this lady in Kimberly, we took everything that we could out of the city code and put it into policies and procedures. The city code has actually two sections now. One you just talked about a moment ago, and that's the residency section. And the other one that's in there that says, if there's a modification to anything relating to hiring, firing, or compensation, that has to be approved by council in one form or the other. And I don't want to get into Ron's presentation because I think he's going to talk about yes. what the other form might be. Go ahead, Ron. Yes. And, and so once a manager you know, creates a new policy or, in this case, proposes to change a policy, but it again falls under the category that the council must approve, we go about it two ways. You know, one, just put it on a normal agenda item and it gets approved, and we did that recently in changing the holidays. We brought a policy change to the council, and then again, we were trying to, you know, because it was a simple change, that, that other one that we kind of failed on doing with the 14-day rule. Under the 14-day rule, we send you the proposed change to the policy or the procedure and if two council members, do, uh, uh, if no, well, if two council members object, then, you know, it's not approved. But if, if, if less than two council members object, then the policy goes into effect after 14 days. Yeah. So that, those are just two methods. I just wanted to basically make sure a council said, he understands that we've got two ways to go about changing them. Some of them may be a more expedited way, other just a normal council uh, agenda item. So <clears throat> this proposed amendment, we, we're basically trying to clarify what we've been following in, in our practice. When, when someone requests leave without pay, and in many cases this pertains to if we close early because of a you know, hurricane or, or something like that, uh, an em employee uh, you know, would like to get full pay uh, for that remaining hours or that, uh, that, that they have to really uh, request their personal time to, to get that, or get, it'll be registered as leave without pay. We didn't have it written in there, the order and w the, the fact that you must use your personal time, your vacation, before you can request leave without pay. And one of the reasons we probably do that is to basically limit the city's liability because you know the, any time that uh, that vacation time or that ends up being paid out to an employee when they when they leave. So it's kind of a, a fiscal uh, management thing. But so what we wanted to do is basically make sure it was clear the order in which people use their accrued personal time, and then in the meantime. We added a personal day for employees, and so what we're saying in the in the proposed change to the, the policy is you must use your personal time or vacation time before you can, in fact, receive be you know logged in as leave without pay. Okay, let me ask you this: then. Mm -hmm. uh, What are they allowed to bank? Accrued. Yeah. Well, the only thing they really they. You know, they, they bank so well. Police end up having, because of working on a holiday, police and fire can hold that holiday, you know, and use that, you know, if they worked on a holiday. And I'm not, T, you want to comment on that? They can, and then it's cashed out at the end of the fiscal year for holding the time. But other than the police and fire, there's no other banking. You know, in other words, you, you can accrue 240 days leave max vacation time, 240 hours rather, of uh, vacation time. And, uh, and anything over that, say you've got 250 at the end of a pay period, those, those 10 hours over automatically roll in your sick time. And uh, I mean, that's, those are the only things that you really accrue. You, now with the new personal day, you end up in that 12-month period, you've got one personal day 
if you don't use it in that 12 month period, that goes away at the end of that 12 month period and you start all over. Well, the reason I raised that issue with that particular policy there was because with a personal floating holiday, that's not an established regular holiday. You know, when, what I wanted to know is what, what they did to take that, for instance, okay, could they be denied taking that? If, if for if for <clears throat> for necessity out of a business necessity that, that's exactly right if, if we can't allow that person to be off for that day you know for for business Operation. reasons yeah then we we would deny them that but uh, we've got to give them the opportunity to use like the personal day use it within that 12 month period of time is there a time frame they have to request for that like so many days in advance or is it kind of be spur of the moment or well, I mean, it depends on the department. Right. You know, it's uh, uh, certainly police, police and yeah. fire have a, have, have a little more, uh, you know, they, they've got some more changing to do when that happens. They've got to replace people. Uh, most other departments, uh, you know, I think most directors are pretty flexible on, on, on so approving. So, okay, so it only lasts for a year. At the end of the year, it goes away. Yes, okay. sir. And according to the proposal before you tonight, that's the first item you'd have to take. Take, if you have a personal day, you take that first. Second one would be vacation time, and then you go to leave without pay. In that order, it's the way it's set for. Okay. Is that customary for that to disappear after a year? Yes, for, sir. For other jurisdictions? The exempt the employees family? have had, and I think Kimberly wants to say something, but let me finish with your question. The exempt employees have had two personal days for several years. The exempt employees now have three personal days. It is the non exempt employees who only have the one personal day and it has been the policy of the city that if you don't take those two days within that year's period of time they evaporate they go away so they don't accrue a compensatory time and that's a thing in the past yes so often we have to adjust policies and procedures and a lot of it because practice has always dictated what we did. And someone will say, well, the policy or the procedure doesn't say that. And we look and we go, oh, let's clarify. This was simply a clarification. We've always, if someone, and for obvious reasons, if someone wants to take a leave without pay, you don't want someone to leave for two weeks and then come back and say, oh, I'm taking two weeks vacation. So if you, you cannot take a leave without pay, you have to exhaust any leave you currently have in this order. And that's why we clarified it to say in this order. I think what complicated it is for good complication reasons, you added a personal day. So we, in adjusting it to read, you must take vacation first. If you have it before a leave without pay, we had to add the personal time in. So um, they're absolutely correct. You have to use that personal time before the end of the year. Uh, and we do get to bank 240 hours of vacation. So that very generous, actually. So thirty days, right? About thirty days. Yeah. On a eight-hour day. Yeah. That took six weeks. And then it rolls to sick. You don't lose it. In most organizations, not necessarily local government, as many of you know, um, you use your vacation or you lose it. Right? They don't usually allow it to roll. We roll for two hundred forty hours, and then after two hundred forty hours, that rolls to sick. So you still have. You haven't lost it totally, yeah. and that applies. The, and those six hours applies retirement. to your retirement. Yeah. When you get a retirement, that extends your years of, of service towards your retired pay computation. I have a question with regards to personal leave. So say, for example, if you have a worker um, that rarely takes leave, and a co-worker in their department has... Um, a medical issue in which that employee has exhausted all of their leave. Could I, as an employee, donate my personal leave to that other person? It's a great question. So we did change that actually several years ago and it came before you as well, probably under the 14 day rule, because we had just like this, someone said, brought something up and we said, wow, we need to tweak that. We had um, what we call donated leave. So we do have that practice, that policy. They have to qualify under FMLA. So it is identified as a serious health condition, and that's a very broad definition. 
And if they do qualify, then yes, we send out the minute they do, they will ask us to receive donated leave and we send an email to all employees and you'd be very, your heart would be touched by the amount of personal leave those and sometimes more than they could use. Um, people donate their vacation, so they have to donate their vacation. And donate sick leave, you can only donate your vacation. Okay. But your personal leave is not the same as your sick. No. That's just your personal. So anything that's donated to another employee vacation. has to be vacation. It's earmarked for vacation only. It comes out of their, their, their vacation, vacation balance. balance. That employee's willing to give up so many days or hours out of their vacation balance to allow that other person to take sick leave. And, and Dr. Washington, it, it is at the rate that employee is yes. paid, mm -hmm. which is important. Uh, an employee such as myself, Mr. Massey, could donate an hour or half a day to a sanitation or a streets worker, and that may be three or four days for them, you know, depending on rates of pay. So that is a benefit. But what we would be giving up in that donation would be our vacation time. It does not apply to giving up my personal time, nor does it apply to giving up my sick leave. That is not applicable. So when people take leave, me, for example, the first thing I'm going to use up is my personal leave. Right, because we're going to lose it at the end of the year. You're going to use that personal leave first, then use your vacation. I was just thinking when Hurricane Florence came through, and with our police, um, with our firefighters, you know, that's the biggest part of our budget. But some of our workers, including police and fires and others that work for the city, had tremendous damage that was done to their homes and they had to take leave. So I guess in my mind, I'm struggling because as a government employee, when you're talking about personal leave, we have three, no, four personal leaves every year that we are given. And if I do not use all of those four days automatically roll over into sick and I automatically get four more the following year. So I don't lose anything. So I'm just wondering, um, is there any way that we can capture for those individuals that do not lose, that have their, their personal leave and they do not utilize it for whatever reason, is there any way that we can bank that somewhere within the city that with hard times, that time can go to someone else an hour here or an hour there. I think about COVID, you know, um, many people who may not have had a lot of leave on the book, but yet they were having to stay home because when COVID was hitting, it was really hitting and um, people, you know, were losing days. They was losing money because they was trying to recruit. So I was just in my mind thinking, how can we utilize saving personal leave so even in the event a worker did not use that time that time is just gone for good we can't find a way to recycle that and put it back in the system for the good of our employees one of the reasons why we eliminated uh, capturing comp time is because from an accounting standpoint it's a liability and you actually have to account that in your in your accounting and have to disclose that. So we eliminated comp time because that was again, again an additional liability on the city's books. And I would think that the same thing would happen if you tried to sort of hold on to uh, lost time. You would just be accruing expenses that would have to be reflected on the city's books. Okay. Yeah. Thank I have a you. Quick question. So, oh, is there? Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm just no. So, is there a reason why we classify from vacation as sick? I mean, like for us personally, we just do it as pay time off. We, you just use it how you want to, and you have X amount of hours. You just, is there a reason why it's separate, or is it because that's the way we just do it? I'm just curious. So private sector went to PTO about 10 or 15 years yeah. ago and governments never did. Gotcha. So, well, one, one, reason. Thing, one thing, one thing is like with sick leave, sick leave can be applied to your years of service or, or your time. Yeah. Of service. And that might be because there's, yeah, 
the, the yeah. state allows you to, to take that. So imagine after 240 hours of, of vacation, you can't roll anymore. So it's pushed into your sick leave. We have people, when they retire, they've got a year more. They retire a year early. Oh, yes. They have two years early. That's right. Early. That's yeah. right. They, they get the credit as if they served an extra year, gotcha. but they, they get to retire that one year before then because gotcha. they have that accrued sick leave. And I don't know why. And that's, know. that's yeah. probably why. As long as the retirement system offers mm -hmm. that benefit, which they'll probably have to to anybody that's in there right now, you know, you, you, you won't take that away. It's quite a benefit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. When I retired, I retired with 30 years and seven months and with sick leave, it was 32, 32 years even. And the way your retirement is calculated is based on a formula. You have time or multiple to your salary, then your years of service. Okay. Uh, so that counts as part of your, how your retirement is figured out. It's still a benefit, a big one, mm -hmm. at the end when you want it. Yeah, again, that's part of the whole compensation package. Yeah. And sometimes employees don't understand enough about the full compensation package that, that they really do receive. That'd be the main reason, probably one of the main reasons why it's kept separate. Because I'll bet, yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. If there aren't any other questions, I'd ask that council consider approving the change to the HR procedure. Okay, motion. You want, you want to? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. Second. Does somebody make a motion? Uh, Bob. Bob did. Okay. Sorry, I missed that. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. Council. Next, we have the amendment. You'll see. We have Ant Anthony was scheduled to present this. Uh, Anthony's not feeling well, so. I feel like I can present this. Yeah, to you, I think so. you've got enough information. Yeah. Oh, I was going to do that, Mr. Massey. <laughs> 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 in two me, circles, he, we're going to connect the dots. He <laughs> left me the videotape. <laughs> so a little background is, is that we've identified the need for some pedestrian improvements at Old Bridge Street. You know, the, the traffic, the foot traffic that's there because of the, the courthouse and that. Uh, you know, is what brought this to our attention. And so what, what we're proposing to do and is do bump out similar to what we've done here outside of Newbridge Street. You know, right over here where we basically bump the sidewalk out a little bit. What that does is narrows the distance that people are actually crossing the street and that. And it also gives them a safe place to stand while they're waiting for the traffic to clear. And they're also more visible when they stand on those bump outs. So we have, we have the opportunity to, to basically uh, go ahead and make these improvements to Old Bridge Street. It's a state-maintained street. They've, they've approved us doing that. And it's, some, it's a project that we identified uh, when we received FTA, FTA CARES money, you know, that we would potentially look at using that CARES money for. So what's, what's happened is we've actually designed the project and we bid it. Uh, well, let me just, the, here's basically what the bump ops will do and, uh, and give us, of course, handicap crossing. Same thing with Mill Street. Is it still 20 miles an hour? There? Yes, sir. Okay. You have to once you cross the bridge until you get to the, the, uh, the old uh, railroad street. And so the, the project uh, basically did come in a little bit over the bid, but uh, it's not, ex not surprising right now. But again, this is CARES money, 100% federal money. It's part of the $4 million that we received as part of the FTA CARES funding. About 500000 of that was used for free fares when we, uh, during the COVID. So... Uh, I mean, that's what we're, what we're asking is that council uh, approve the award of the contract using CARES money. Well, I would have a question. I mean, not 100% pertaining to this, but if you, if you go back to that map, sure. what, what's going to happen with the parking? I know the you know, IOP bought the old church, and they're going to turn that. I know a lot of people use that parking lot, and I was talking to Jose over there about it. 
they're going to try to open it or, you know, let people use it a little bit, but I'm just kind of worried about parking. There's not a ton down there. What if, say, the school's using their space and there's a lot of, you know, private uh, lots for the attorneys and there's not a lot, what's going to happen with the parking downtown with... Well, of course, that's, that's a question the county really needs to answer. Yeah. Well, I, where are they going to stick it? They kind of run yeah. out of land down there. Yeah. <laughs> well, mm -hmm. part of the problem is where people want to pop park where they're, versus where the parking is available. Mm -hmm. You know, in reality, there is parking, but it's up on top of the hill. It's there between our public safety building and the, uh, the, the county jail. Yeah, have to walk yeah. And, 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 you know, there's, there, there's a need to look, too, on the route from there to, to the courthouse. But, uh, I mean, there's two routes you can take. You could go down Court Street and then down Old Bridge Street, or you can go down uh, Tallman and, and on to Ann Street. But, uh, but that's, you know, in my, in my estimation, that's a question you ask your fellow yeah. county commissioner. Yeah. created a problem. Yeah, we did a we did a traffic study here several years ago on the downtown area, and, and as Ron said, there's there's plenty of spaces. It's just not convenient to the courthouse and, and so forth. You know, we even even talked briefly about perhaps uh, some sort of a parking parking deck, parking garage there, where the county we own some land. Uh, that big parking area there by the, the public safety. Mm -hmm. We own some land. The county owns most of the land there, and we we talked about, it, but you know, we didn't really do anything at, yeah. the, at the time. We just well, talked land, about it. Land is becoming a premium down there, as far as yep. for, for the purpose of parking. At some, at some point, be probably a good investment by somebody to build a parking. Yeah, parking deck of some type down there. It, it, that's true. That's that's where you are with a downtown area like that without a lot of land uh, available for parking. You then have to start going vertical. That's a lot of studies have done this. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, but most of those are owned by private, private yeah. 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 From what I, yeah. but but of course you can do that too. You you know I mean the building turnpikes these days that's like toll roads that way with private public partnerships. And we build it puts the end of free parking. Yeah. <laughs> the city of Wilmington has public parking they charge for and parking decks. So yeah. did, there was just an, an ad that they were going up on the rates. You may have seen that. Yeah. But I think to Mr. Sosa's point, it, 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 we learned last night that the high school, the Catholic high school, will be going in this space. And the <coughs> plans right now are to open it up for the 23 24 school year. Mm -hmm. So things will be dramatically changing in the next 12 months in downtown Jackson. I think it would be a good add-on, you know, for the downtown community, for that school. I guess. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to get off subject, but I was just No, no, apartment. well, that's, that's what a workshop's all about. Yeah. You, know, you, you, you get into something and you discuss. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's nice. I mean, they're going to do a great job. There. ADA parking down there has already been an issue, too, around the courthouse. There's, yeah. you know, not handicapped not parking. Well, just with events like last night, we had a great turnout and everything, but I mean, people are spread all over the place and they're walking, which brings, you know, traffic concern, people walking down the middle of the street. And so, you know, we should have, uh, we should have used the, some of our outlying areas for that, like we've done in past years. And we didn't use our buses for that. We did. We, we, did. we did. Right there. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah, we ran the bus. So what we do is we basically use city hall parking. We run the bus. It goes by the, uh, uh, county consolidated health where they've got parking okay. and we, it runs up to the parking we talked about by public safety mm -hmm. the bus circulates around there and so people that want to want to park in the available parking lots can jump on the bus yeah. well thank you sir so we need you council to approve yeah. it okay I'll approve uh, that plan Okay, uh, the word of the approval of the construct, construction contract for Old Bridge Street pedestrian safety improvements. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. I'll, 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 there's some other update items that I can go through with, but I'll skip some. Okay. Whatever, yeah. you're, whatever you're comfortable with. Yes. When we, we had the detailed discussion about finding green, I'm sorry about the Commerce Road extension to Piney Green, you know, previously, and I just wanted to report back that the bid, the project was bid. Uh, the low bidder was uh, was Mill Fed, uh, just under the project uh, engineer's estimate, which is amazing for today's 
and that and that's the schedule and that so that's a good thing going forward yeah. okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip this part of it this gets a little more complicated this is the involves the extension of the rails to trails where it ends right now behind the middle school mm -hmm. on Railroad Street and we've talked before about the, the concept uh, of connecting basically yeah. the trail down to the Riverwalk Park and then be able to connect it to the Sturgeon City Boardwalk. The, the, the challenge is, uh, well, let me just show you a little more detail on that. That's the way that that'll be similar, you know, uh, to what the existing trail is, asphalt area. Uh, we'll get new signal at that intersection where, where we end up um, having a little more challenge uh, is over there by the the, uh, the telephone building, uh, and we're going to end up on the street. Uh, <clears throat> and then I'm talking about we'll have to take some lanes right there by the curb by the by the telephone building. But uh, <clears throat> and then of course it it uh, is going to go down parallel to Court Street and then use Newberry Street to get to the actual uh, uh, boardwalk. It will then also connect, of course, to Riverwalk Park, and eventually you'll be able to go down. You know, you'll just be able to ride down uh, Railroad and, uh, and Willingham Parkway down there. But what the big, and this is the funding for the project, uh, uh, we've got DOT funding. However, the bid, this is where the bidding climate has been challenging. And, uh, and that's, that's what our, our lowest bid after a second bidding, and uh, what we're what we're doing now is we're going back to see if there's any way we can, in fact, make further adjustments and get the cost down. Seeing whether DOT's got any ability to to, to provide more contribution, but of course, if they do under the 80-20, then we'll have to increase what we've got available. And what we'll do is look at where we might have some money. And other projects that could be closed out of that to make that up. But we'll have a, a, another discussion on, on whether or not we move forward with this. But you know, the one of the big things from a tourism standpoint is the whole idea of our trail network. You know, it's it's becoming more and more of an asset. And and so the more that we can do to have different options and the connectivity, the better it is from a tourism standpoint. So I just put that out there as a, as a thought. Uh, any questions on that? Well, we just, uh, since we brought up the rails, you know, we had, a, had an incident where um, we had some, one of the people I was riding with it was injured and was unable, actually broke her shoulder. And trying to get EMS to go in to help was, was a problem. Number one, telling them exactly where we were on the trail and so that they could be there. And then number two, uh, they refused to get off the road. So here you have no way to get to an injured person. What if, what if that had been a heart attack? What if that was a life-threatening emergency? We, uh, so we, you know, I, I know we had some initial discussion. I know <coughs> Richard was working on it with, with, with the county, with, uh, the, this, with the EMS, and and so forth. So I'm just curious where we're at on, okay. on some of those. I, I, I can talk about that. Okay. The, uh, what the, the, <clears throat> the, the fire and, and police have identified areas sort of mid trail where you can get to the trail. Okay. And they're basically putting address points in and that so that from a response time or response uh, uh, <clears throat> management you know, they can identify, they can send the vehicle to that location where they know they can enter the trail to get to that section of the trail. And that the other thing we're doing is we're going to end up having to make some adjustments to what we call the segments of the trail. Right now we call rails to trails, okay? So, and then the idea of the rails to trails kind of starts at the Jacksonville station. You know, and then it goes down to Lejeune, and then it goes along Lejeune Boulevard. And oh, by the way, it comes back Lejeune Boulevard and through the garden. And so you can't just say rails to trails. So what, we, what we're moving to do is I named segments. 
of the trail. Like, like for example, we'll call it the Lejeune Greenway, and we'll probably call the whole trail along Lejeune, and then you'll have mile markers, so to speak, along that segment of the trail. And then you'll have a segment of the trail that basically is, is along Marine Boulevard. And I think we may call that the downtown trail. And it basically would be from, say, Sturgeon City, where the boardwalk, all the way up to Jacksonville Station. And then from Jacksonville Station, probably down to Lejeune is probably the rails to trails and that. But that they're, they're in the process of, of doing that. And, and, and then we'll put out mile markers uh, from the zero point, just like you find on the highway. So that's, that's in, in progress right now. But I think at least they know if we can identify where they are on the trail, they know where some of the access points are. They've already identified that. And then just like the tunnels, we talked about things like, you know, putting a red stripe on one tunnel and a blue stripe on the other tunnel. So you can say, what well, color's the stripe yeah. on the tunnel? I'm in the tunnel, you know, things like that. But that, it's working. Mm -hmm. uh, as we mentioned, that uh, we're operating Jacksonville Transit with city employees. Things are going well. Uh, those employees are happy to be with us. Mm. And uh, so that's a, it's a good thing. They, uh, yes, they, they probably did not have any really benefits with the other. With they were limited. They were, they've got they more. They were limited. Oh, obviously, yeah. they've got yeah. more. They're, they're now yes. going to be vested yes. in the retirement yes. system and, and the sick leave and the personal yes. stuff, all I the think, stuff we've done. I think done. the number of about 14, I think, that are fully benefited. So they've got all the things we were talking about earlier in there. So that's a big improvement. And we officially call in the station open as of this past Monday. The, uh, you already acted on that. So uh, at this point, we can uh, go to uh, one, city. Right, one city moment here. Of course, we had uh, the running with the law uh, <clears throat> last Saturday, and there were over 400 uh, entries in the race, so it, it continued to grow. You know, probably one of the things that, that, you know, is we don't probably promote enough the fact that this the proceeds go to Special Olympics. You know, I mean, it's, it's tied to, to <laughs> running with the law and National Night Out, which is good, but we might get some more interest you know, people knew that, that you know, that it was, it was going to benefit Special Olympics. And the rain course participated. Go back, was that a, uh, one more? One more. Okay. Was it uh, upper left? Is that a, a, is that what you do? You run, you lose it, and then you lose it. Is, a weight yeah. loss, is this a weight yeah. loss thing? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm just right. Yeah, yeah that, that's a good backdrop. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good, good participation. And then of course, National Night Out, uh, General Nebel there. Good that uh, mm -hmm. he, it was his first opportunity to, to learn about National Night Out. Well, I thought Councilmember Washington was there last night. I don't She's there behind you. I was late. That's my bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that band was working. Yeah, yeah they really. That band was working. We need to hire them. <laughs> Keith, 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 and Freeway. Wow. Love that bicycle giveaway. That is yes. really a blessing yeah, to a lot of folks. Really People start to I think the only thing if we could well, change next year is just turn the temperature down. <laughs> well, I tell you what, if it's not <laughs> raining, it's hotter than that. One way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The mayor and um, Chief Unaro was mentioning that next year is the 25th anniversary, so I think we should do something really good next year for the 25th anniversary. Like Move it to October? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you see how this I GSP works? I, I will not complain. You know, I, you know, I, know, I know we want to be, in, and I, Chief's not here, but I, I know we want to be in concert with all the other communities across our nation. 
that are doing this, but, but what would be the harm in trying to find a, an October date? I don't think you're eligible for the yeah. award. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, you get, you get boxed. Box. Yeah, 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 they darn no, no pain, no gain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the truck idea is great. Be such the kids will love it. I, I think the adults will love it. If, if we did something like shit the idea earlier about using the fire truck, I mean, that would be kind of... Are we going to turn the hose on? Yeah. 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 No, no. Just spray in the air. Yeah. 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 Kids, yeah. I'll be on it. nozzles. And hot. If you just spray it up, it'd be just yeah. like a rain yeah. by the time, you know. And by the time it came down, it'd be hot. Yeah. <laughs> but but wait, would you have that ball field <laughs> and the basketball court? If the kid court, doesn't listen, you just turn it on and knock them out. It could work. Do you have anything else? That's it. Pardon? Thank you. Mayor, I have two informational items for council. I just emailed council a couple of pictures. Uh, you, just, you have just gotten them. But then, these are pictures of where a contractor for a utility company has gone out on Henderson Drive and in one area has actually taken up a section of our sidewalk and put a, a, a light pole right in the middle where this was. In the other section, they've actually cut it out and put the light pole. But anyway, I just want you to know if you get questions from residents, it's unbelievable what people do these days. But uh, is the veteran Wally, the people, sir, is the veteran the people? No, 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 no. This was actually a contractor for Duke yeah. uh, putting in new, uh, replacing uh, utility poles. So I guess that's part of their right away too, right? I don't know. But anyway, I want you to know Wally's and his staff are Bell. contacting. We help. We'll get that remedy one way or the other. The other thing I wanted to mention, Mayor and Council, is if you've been keeping up with, of course, COVID is still very much present uh, in the community, but the governor on August 15th is going to do away with his emergency declaration. On August 15th, the mayor is going to do away with his declaration also. Finally. The mayor's... Finally, well, I've been wanting to. Well, the mayor's <laughs> declaration has really... The only reason we've kept it is because the prior finance director who is not here this evening the current <laughs> finance director is the only one who's left with us this evening it gives us the opportunity to do it to announce our new finance director. yes sabrina, sabrina Adams. congratulations sabrina. congratulations, Thank you. congratulations. <laughs> but the prior finance director felt that the mayor's uh, declaration of emergency should stand in place just in case fema required that for some funding uh for etc so that's why it's done but when the governor uh, does away with his on August the 15th, that's going to change one thing significantly. And when y'all have taken, taken opportunity out, that is going to do away with the electronic meetings where you're able to join by phone or by Zoom or, or Teams or whatever and be counted as far as a quorum and, and your votes being counted. That authority goes away when the governor does that, unless the legislature in the future takes some action to do it. So if you can't be here or... or and so forth. You can't be here. You can certainly listen in, but as far as you being counted for the quorum or being able to vote, that is going to be done away with on August the 15th. Just want to make sure council was aware of that. Thank you. Good. Good. Council. Anybody? That's it. Uh, motion we've to got move. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're yes, all right back here. Right. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Yep. All in favor, say so right by saying aye. Aye. All opposed.